Okay, so I am not a leeche. I am Michelle Alexander. Um, this work is actually related to a leeche's PhD that I am supervising. She couldn't be here today, so I have very graciously uh, said that I would um, read this out for her. Um, if anything relates to any particular site details you want to know about, I might not know the answer to them, okay? But I do know most of the stuff that she's doing, obviously. You'd like to think I did anyway, seeing as I am actually supervising this work. So this is uh, part of her PhD project that's using stable isotopes to reconstruct the diet of Muslims and Christians in medieval Portugal. The data set that she's actually working on is, is a much larger one, including 10 sites from the north to the south of the country, spanning a chronology of almost five centuries from the 9th to the 14th centuries. Today, uh, two case studies are involved in this presentation, uh, one of Beja and the other of Silvage, chosen because of their intriguing archaeological context. Before introducing the two sites and the results of the paleo diet of these populations, the, um, I will give a brief overview of the religious and social stratification um, in uh, medieval um, Iberia. Okay, so Al Andalus is the name given by the Muslim conquerors to Islamic Spain and Portugal. And during a period of eight centuries, Muslims, Christians, and Jews coexisted in this land. What's particularly interesting about a multi faith society like this. Um, is the possibility to assess the impact of both Muslim and Christian conquest on different faith groups um, that were living in that area, since shifting political powers will cause the majority to become the minority and vice versa. However, dealing with minorities requires some caution because of the underlying assumptions that come with coexistence of different cultures, faiths or ethnic groups within the same population. In the case of Al-Andalus, we have two major assumptions that can be found in well-known scholarship, supported by historical sources. <clears throat> we have the fact that we think that minorities are different from the majority, and this difference, and by faith is what I'm talking about here, the ethnic makeup of the population is an additional complicating factor, which I won't go into today. But this faith difference is enough to set them apart from the community and as a lead kind of defining characteristics. Minorities and majority usually engage in enduring hostilities that create tensions within the community. And building on these assumptions, authors have followed two main sort of research approaches, if you like. One in which there's a conflicting view, claiming that major hostilities took place between uh, Christians, Muslims and Jews during their coexistence under both Muslim and Christian rule. But others following a more romantic view, um, if you like, uh, try to see in their coexistence um, sort of seed, if you like, of a more complex culture of tolerance. And in reality, we're going to have a mixture of both of those sort of stances. And this is reflected um, in her research, which is taking this middle ground, which is, can be quite annoying uh, if you want certainties. But cultural, social, and ethnic, and faith categories are more fluid, blur blurred, and broader than these definitions. So to give <clears throat> a little bit of uh, sort of introduction to that then, and uh, an example. Because of the long duration of the cohabitation of Muslims and Christians in Iberia, and we're going to focus on Muslims and Christians because we're not allowed to work with Jewish cemeteries, um, certainly not for destructive analysis anyway, which is what we're actually undertaking. So because of this long duration of the cohabitation of Muslims and Christians in Iberia during the uh, medieval period of about eight centuries, the sole category of Muslim or Christian falls short in describing this multi faith society that's in constant transformation due to these shifting borders. Uh, Glick helpfully uh, illustrated the main categories that we could find in medieval Liberia, um, and this is uh, a table here that's taken from his work and focuses on Al Andalus. And in the case of religious continuity, Christians living under Islamic rule were called Mozarabs. When Christians converted to Islam, they were called Muladi. And towards the end of Islamic rule, since Arabic was the common language, groups of Christians who were speaking Arabic were then called Mustara, which means Arabicized. And we have a similar thing going on as well. In Christian Spain, so the later period, we have similar categories. We have Muslims living under Christian rule called Muharis. Um, Muslims that converted to Christianity would be called conversos. And then Christians speaking Arabic um, who were called Arabic Azuz. Uh, that one. And also, uh, you have also Muslims speaking Spanish as well, given their own term as well. So this gives you some idea of uh, the complexity of, kind of minorities and um, the way in which they coexisted over that time. 
Now, as we've already heard um, today, um, and we are using this tool in, our, in, in this research, we are identifying um, eth- uh, religious, or eth- religious groups, anyway, uh, by uh, barrier practice a very common method of identifying these kind of social groups in the archaeological record. And this is quite a nice um, illustration, if you like, of the difference between Muslim and Christian burial practices. And this is actually um, an example taken from one of the sites that are being discussed today, Beja, where you have Muslims and Christians buried in the same cemetery. And you can see here the very clear differences in their um, burial practice there. So Christians tend to be buried supine, with an east-west orientation of the body, and Muslims' burials are orientated towards Mecca, and the body lies on the right side. You can see that difference there quite clearly. The identification of faith group, in conjunction with an absolute or relative chronology of sites, makes it possible the identification of cemeteries of religious minorities in medieval Spain and Portugal. And several sites containing both Muslim or Christian graves have been identified across the peninsula. But to find Muslims and Christians in the same site is a little bit more uh, rare just why we like it. So to orientate yourself about where we're going to be talking about today, we're looking at um, ostensibly the southern area of Portugal, and um, Beja being a little bit more interesting the interior, a little bit north um, of Sulish, uh, which is uh, further south in um, that also southern area of Al-Andalus as well. So... The medieval cemeteries found in Beja and Silvesh are introduced today to show how field archaeology and biomolecular archaeology can be paired to investigate the role of minorities, and specifically, in this case, Christians living under Muslim rule. So we're looking at Moz Arabs mostly today and looking at their diet. In addition, the impact of the conquista on the Christian communities uh, in terms of their diet will be assa- assessed uh, in Silvesh, where we have later groups of Christians uh, living in that city. Diet has long been regarded as an appropriate tool to investigate identities in the past, and this um, diet might be manipulated by a person themselves through the choices of the foods they eat, but they can also be affected by society at large, so their access to certain foods might also be restricted, which might be beyond their control. In addition, the consumption or restriction of specific foods have been regulated by religious norms throughout the entire history of both the Christian and Muslim faiths. And we have a really strong connection there then with dietary identity and faith for both these uh, major religions. So um, the research questions there, thanks to the fact that we do have um, what we think are contemporaneous Muslims and Christians buried in the same cemetery at that site, we have two main research questions. Do Christians show different diet compared to Muslims at Beja? If so, is there any trace of social and religious discrimination linked to their faith identity? For example, do we have a poor diet which might be represented by uh, less protein or meat intake or the consumption of less desired crops, as we know um, happen quite quite often really in in the medieval world? And a slightly different question uh, when we're looking at Shilvej what is the impact of the conquest of the Christian community in Silvish? And does uh, the Christian conquest affect the diet of Christian groups? So do Christians in, in the later period in Silvish, who are under Christian rule, look different or the same to Christians that we think are under Muslim rule in Beja in the early period? Okay, so I'm sure you've seen this before, so I'm just going to remind you. Uh, we're looking at isotopes here, and so what we generally do is we differentiate between terrestrial and marine uh, ecosystems, with terrestrial going more towards the kind of bottom uh, left-hand side of the graph, and marine ecosystems looking uh, a bit more sort of upper right-hand side of the graph. One other thing to point out is the difference between C3 and C4 plants and the carbon axis that runs along the bottom here. And these C4 plants tend to be the more um, undesirable crops. Uh, they don't make particularly good bread. What you want is lovely white wheat bread um, if you are fancy in the medieval period. You don't want to have to be subsisting on that unless uh, you really have to. Or well, that's the idea anyway. So there is a possibility of maybe having a C3, C4 difference, but the most important thing is terrestrial and marine difference that we've got there. So moving on to our first site of Beja. Um, as it's been said, We know that we have cemeteries of both Christians and Muslims across the Iberian Peninsula, but it's quite rare to have them both uh, actually at the same um, site. So um, this is the layout of the medieval town. 
uh, with a main area highlighting different colours. You can see there's a, there was a Moorish quarter here. This is uh, later nomenclature uh, relating to women uh, under uh, Christian control. That's why it's the Moorish quarter. And we've got a Jewish quarter as well. You've got your gates marked city walls. And then outside the city walls, you've got a red square. And that is where we have the cemetery um, that uh, we'll be looking at the burials from today. And there's some kind of dark green dots there. That's where a few other burials, I think, have kind of popped up. But the main uh, body of the cemetery is in that uh, red square there. Um, this is the location of the major necropolis that was excavated between 2006 and 2011 and um, uh, excavated from there were 255 Muslims and 21 Christians, identified by their differing burial practice. We don't have an absolute chronology for this yet, this is quite common. The problem with Beja, there's no stratigraphy, everyone is buried in one level. Um, so we're waiting for radiocarbon dating, which may or may not actually do what we want and actually tell us whether these um, are, um, are actually contemporaneous uh, burials. But the fact that we have intersecting Muslims and Christians, and we've got Muslims on top of Christians and Christians on top of Muslims, we've got kind of both there, uh, which really do, does suggest um, that these two groups are contemporaneous um, at this site. Then we also have silvage, um, and this is used as a comparison to the data from Beja. Here we have separate burial grounds for the Muslim and um, the Christian burials, with the Christians pertaining to the late period, so they're under Christian control in the 13th century, but the Muslim burials pertaining to um, an earlier, um, under uh, Muslim rule, I believe, um, for those ones there, and they're in different areas that you can see the Muslim uh, cemetery, as we would assume, would be outside the city walls, whereas uh, the Christian cemetery is associated with a church um, in this case. And what we have are the results. Okay, so the first graph to look at is the one on the top left there, and these are the results from Beja. And the first thing that you will notice is that there is a difference between Muslim and Christian diets at this site, which was entirely unexpected. So green triangles are Muslims, and the uh, red diamonds there are Christians. So we have here burial practice being very quite clearly linked with diet. And that doesn't usually come out with stabilised uh, uh, studies, um, certainly not in the medieval period, and certainly not from Iberian uh, Peninsula, not in such a clear um, way. So we can see from the Muslim diet that generally it looks like they're probably pretty terrestrial, um, subsisting on uh, terrestrial protein. We do have one individual who's quite high up there, who looks quite different from everyone else. Um, so that's quite intriguing. The thing about diet is, uh, you know, we can also have individuals that are deriving from other places in our data set, and they will also potentially look different uh, in the graph. So I think that green triangle up there might be somebody who's from somewhere either hot and arid, which might not be unexpected uh, in, under Muslim rule, but also might be somebody who's eating a lot of fresh water fish, which um, potentially, but um, I don't know what to say. The Christians, in comparison to Muslims, have more enriched carbon values and more enriched nitrogen values. So they are kind of diagonally uh, related, if you like, there's a kind of a nice trend line there. And that suggests that potentially we're looking at more marine foods being consumed by Christians uh, as opposed to uh, the Muslims who are subsisting on more terrestrial foods. And this would be uh, really nice and tempting, and we'll go out there if we try and say it that might be related to Christian fasting. Because um, we know that Christians are having to fast probably about a third of the year, really, uh, for lay people, um, two or three days a week. And marine fish uh, was the kind of go-to um, for that fasting. If you couldn't access fish, you just didn't eat meat. Uh, so, you know, it's not, all, it's not mandatory if you can to eat fish. I haven't seen this before in any other kind of Iberian data set that I know of. So that's quite fascinating there, and this might be having then this really clear link with faith and diet coming out. When we look at the data from Silverish, which is on this uh, bottom uh, right-hand side of the graph, again, the green triangles are Muslims, but uh, here the Christians are purple dots because they are uh, sort of post-Christian conquest. And again, we have a differentiation between the two uh, religious groups. The early Muslims having a more terrestrial diet, but then in, after the Christian conquest, the Christians in this area seem to be subsisting on more marine foods again, and perhaps even more than at Beja. And given the actual location of the sites, where the is a little bit um, closer to the coast, that might be potentially a reason for this. There is a wider range, so if you plotted the Beja Christians against the Silvish Christians, they'd probably be about here. So you can see Silvish has this kind of broader um, 
uh, signature of carbon and nitrogen. Uh, and what Alice is suggesting, we haven't talked about this yet. Um, is that you could have people coming from elsewhere here too, which wouldn't be, which would be expected, um, because after the Christian conquest, you have depopulation of, of uh, Muslim areas, and you put Christians in there. So we, it's more than likely we do have people coming into that area. But regardless, we can see under Muslim rule, Christians are eating more fish, and then the Christian rule, um, under Muslim rule, Christians are eating more fish, and then the Christian rule, they're still eating fish. What we don't see is any kind of change in their status related to whether they're um, in political control or not, it looks like. So there's not kind of um, any kind of differentiation there. So, I don't know how fast I went through that. Pretty much on time. In conclusion, a combination of field archaeology, secured chronology and free new practices could help in identification of religious minorities in medieval Iberian Peninsula. And diet can be used to infer the life ways of these groups, Stable assets have shown that Muslims and Christians have a different diet at Beja. Christians have a larger intake of marine resources, suggesting potentially then this link with Christian fasting. We don't have signs of faith discrimination in relation to the food that they can access, so in terms of specific meat or whatever. So if we had discrimination in terms of access, you might think that Christians would have maybe lower nitrogen values, which might mean that they are a little bit more vegetarian uh, because they can't, have, they can't access um, meat, which might be more desirable, or um, that uh, they'd be subsisting on seafood crops. No one is subsisting on seafood crops, so we're not getting that difference coming out um, in the isotopes there. Silver so showed a similar pattern in terms of Christian uh, versus Muslim diet. The Christians are consuming more marine protein, whether the earlier Muslims have a very terrestrial diet, um, as in Beja. And we have these Christian values showing a little bit more variability, which might be uh, tentatively um, the signature of people coming in um, from another area. And I believe that's it. Oh, yeah.